Joining us now is Rich Goldberg, Senior Advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, Rich, thanks for being with us and coming on this morning. Um, you know, just your initial thoughts on this information that we've gotten, um, especially in the last couple of minutes. Now we have all the names of those people who were found under, under that tunnel in Gaza. Yeah, just uh, two things. One, just a humanity uh, statement. Uh, as an American, uh, as a Jewish American, and as somebody from Chicago, uh, the news uh, on Hirsch is devastating to people around the United States. Whether you're Jewish or not, this is an American citizen who was taken hostage on October 7th and has been brutally murdered in captivity. There are a lot of people who are touched by this uh, in the United States, families around the Chicago area, a lot of close connections, uh, other areas of the country as well where he has relatives, um, a lot of people grieving, a lot of Jewish Americans tonight who feel like this could have been their brother, their son, uh, their relative, uh, and, and truly heartbreaking. Uh, so many friends of mine calling me in tears. Um, and, I, and I hope for those who are not Jewish in America, still a, a feeling of outrage that a terrorist organization of this brutality could feel that it can murder somebody who carries an American passport in cold blood after taking them hostage. That, that's the humanity piece. The policy and the strategic piece, equally important. Where are we today? Where have we been now almost 11 months in from October 7th? We do not treat the sponsors of Hamas like state sponsors of terrorism. We today have kid gloves on Iran, sanctions relief flowing to the regime. We allow their oil to flow to China almost without any interruption. We provide sanctions relief through waivers from the Biden administration, $10 billion to give them some budget relief. The Qataris uh, designated during this administration as a major non-NATO ally today retain that status. We laud them and applaud them for being intermediaries with Hamas for the last almost 11 months. Well, guess what, Doha Qatar? An American has died in captivity. He has been murdered in captivity, not just died. That's on your head. That's on the Qataris, our supposed friends who are brokering a deal. The Egyptians, who we've now found hundreds of tunnels going between Egypt and Gaza through that Rafah border, the Philadelphia corridor where the IDF today stands and is at issue here in these ceasefire talks. What repercussions have we had for Cairo for clearly being complicit in Hamas's rise and reign of terror on Israel? Lebanon, where Hamas has a base of operations and a cell, a war room, where it houses with Hezbollah, with Islamic Jihad, with Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. And Turkey, a NATO ally, a NATO ally, where just in the last couple of days, one of the leaders of Hamas stood pledging more destruction and death for Israel in an open speech. Khalid Mashal, how is this possible? How have we done nothing in 11 months to hold all of these state sponsors of Hamas responsible and accountable? We could have sanctions, we could seize assets, we could remove different designations that provide benefits to these countries. We could hold up foreign assistance to the countries that receive them. We've done nothing. We've praised them. We've used them and respected them as intermediaries in supposed hostage negotiations with a brutal terrorist organization, which we should not be legitimizing. So tonight, I think we should be taking stock of where we are, what our strategy is. There are going to be voices that want to double down on a failed strategy of pressuring Israel to make more concessions. And if you're a family member of a hostage, I understand where you're coming from because you can't reach the Iranians. You can't reach the Qataris. You can't reach the Egyptians. You can only reach the Israelis, a democracy. You can go into the streets and pressure Israel to cave and surrender to Hamas's demands. That is not a good idea for Israel's long-term national security. We, however, have the perspective to say, we should hold their sponsors accountable, and we should give Israel every latitude to go after these leaders, to root out their terrorist infrastructure, and by God, go on offense against the Iran 
terror access, whether it's in Tehran, in Beirut, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, in the West Bank, or certainly in Gaza. One last point. We need to learn a little bit more about what uh, the facts are of, of this case and where the bodies were found and what the circumstances were. We understand from President Biden's statement the bodies were found in a tunnel in Rafa. This is the yeah, southernmost city Rich, on the actually, border of Egypt. I actually just got that yeah, information. Go I, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I just got that information. An IDF spokesperson, um, Daniel Hagar, in a briefing, said the hostages were held in a tunnel 20 meters deep, which is less than a mile from the place Cade Farhan Al Qaeda was found alive last week. They were shot by their captors a short time before the IDF troops arrived. Mm. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's completely outrageous. Uh, it, it, is, um, it, it is a horrific thing to think about, uh, that there is clearly a standing order that as Israel is collapsing on Hamas, uh, that in, in order to uh, ensure that they don't get their people back, that they don't get the hostages back, that they kill the hostages rather than allow them to be rescued. That is how evil this terrorist organization is. It's instructive, instructive to me on twofold. Number one, remember Rafa is the area where Israel wanted to go in many months ago, but was under significant pressure from the Biden administration not to go into Rafa. Why? If Why? You recall. Why was there so much Vice pressure President Harris gave an interview months ago. She saw the maps, she studied the maps, and you couldn't go into Rafa. Uh, I do wonder whether that was a real strategic mistake by the Israelis not to go into Rafa a lot sooner, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I think we actually need to consider the fact that Hamas is not long for this world, that the Israelis are collapsing on the remaining elements of Hamas in Gaza alongside its ongoing operation now in the West Bank. That if the walls are closing in on Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas today, its military leader in Gaza, is he giving a standing order to kill hostages because the walls are closing in so much? And, and that now puts into real stark relief the choice in front of the Israelis. Do you capitulate to Hamas in its 11th hour uh, when you have almost destroyed the organization uh, if it is going to be killing more hostages? Uh, or is there a potential to actually use that military force and pressure on its sponsors to get them to surrender? This is a devil's choice. It's the devil's choice that Hamas invented when they took the hostages. I would not want to be the leader of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. I would not want to be uh, in the decision making because of how emotional and heartbreaking this is for every Israeli. Because as your last uh, commentator talked about, you have the, the prospect of reopening Gaza for business for Hamas if you surrender to their terms. And at the same time, how do you face the families and say, we could have surrendered to their terms and brought your loved ones home, maybe, uh, but we couldn't do that because it would have cost more lives in the long term. Th these are tough moral, ethical uh, problems to, to, have to, to have to deal with, and they're emotional. But when you zoom out, what can we do as Americans? We can put a lot of pressure on their sponsors. We haven't done that. We can give Israel more support to do what it thinks it needs to do uh, to go after Hamas and try to get its people back. We haven't done that. Let's try something different than what we've done the last 11 months, mm -hmm. which hasn't been working. And, and you know, we're still waiting for a, a statement from Kamala Harris. It hasn't come out yet, um, but she should release a statement, as should Donald Trump, as they are running for president of this country. But going back to Harris, she was a part, you know, she is a part of the, the Biden Harris administration. And what she brought up was quite interesting about the pressure from the Biden administration um, not to, to go into this area. And now all this has transpired. Does this make you nervous if we were to have uh, Kamala Harris as, a, as president of the United States, that this would just get worse and nothing would be done? Well, I think it's important to, to reflect on the facts and the reality of the last few months. This administration did withhold weapons from Israel and put enormous pressure on Israel, started unleashing sanctions on Israelis, uh, started putting uh, threatening of sanctions on the IDF and certain units itself. 
uh, started, uh, you know, uh, supporting anti-Israel resolutions at the UN in order to get them not to go into this area where these hostages were apparently being held and were murdered in Rafa. Uh, and had they gone in that much sooner, months ago, to seal that border and to go after these tunnels, we don't know how this would have turned out. I, I do want to, I hesitate in the criticism because I will say the strategy is wrong and I have been against the strategy from the beginning. Then what I've is not the right strategy? I've the Wall Street Journal October 31st saying hold Hamas's sponsors accountable to get more pressure to get the people out. But it, I think it is important whether you're out there criticizing Benjamin Netanyahu for not surrendering to Hamas's terms or you're criticizing the Biden administration for a strategy of pressuring Israel that, rather than pressuring the Iran axis. There is only one party tonight that is responsible for murdering Hirsch and the other hostages, and that's Hamas, a terrorist organization. If we lose sight of that, if we lose perspective on who Hamas is, we don't have good policy recommendations. Once you remember who they are, what they're capable of, and what they will be capable of in the future, if you give them the ability to survive and rebuild, then I think that should help inform us what the right policy decisions are in front of us. You know, I asked Victoria Coates this earlier. Um, if, if you were in charge of of stopping this and getting a ceasefire deal and a hostage release deal, what I mean, where would you start with this? How would you how would you go about it? Number one, you stop legitimizing Hamas as a negotiating partner. This is a terrorist organization. We wouldn't be having negotiating sessions in Doha and Cairo with ISIS or Al Qaeda or Osama bin Laden. It's absolutely insane. If they feel the pressure, if they want to surrender, if they're going to capitulate, if they want to deal, they should come to the table and there should be an all out pressure campaign and warfare against them and their leadership and their sponsors to make that happen. Number two, you don't legitimize their sponsors as true intermediaries, as negotiators, brokers of a deal. When the Qataris came to us on October 8th and said, hey, we've been hosting Hamas for years. We've been giving them money for years. We're their ally in the Muslim Brotherhood. Let us help you broker a deal. When the Egyptians come and said, no, 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 we've been hiding from you all these tunnels to help Hamas smuggle in weapons for years, we can help broker a deal. You don't say, great, we love you guys. What else can we do? It's like the mob's lawyer calling you up and negotiating the terms on behalf of their client. So the idea that we've been empowering Hamas and its sponsors throughout the strategy needs to stop. Maximum pressure goes on Qatar, goes on Egypt, goes on Turkey, which continues to host Hamas, goes on Lebanon, as I said, as well. And then, of course, at the top of the food chain is Iran. Why are we in this mess to begin with? We continue to have an accommodationist strategy towards Iran. If you relieve pressure on Iran, if you give them budget support, if you let them make more money, their terrorist proxies from Hamas to Hezbollah to Islamic Jihad to the Houthis in Yemen and the militias in Iraq and Syria all have more money as well. Clamp down on the head of this octopus of this terror axis and you will see the results come through. And finally, back up your ally. Don't signal pressure publicly. Don't say we're trying to push Israel into better terms for Hamas to get a deal. You tell the Israelis very publicly, whatever you need is on the way. There are American citizens in harm's way. There are American citizens being held hostage. Americans are already massacred on October 7th. Whatever you need. You put all those things together, you'd be surprised what could happen. Do you think the hostages that are still there, around 101, a little over 100, do you think they're alive? We've heard reports of about a third of those, at least, uh, are not alive anymore. Uh, obviously, nothing has been confirmed, but these are based on public reports of leaks from intelligence assessments from the Israelis. Mm. How many uh, are alive today, we don't know. Uh, I, I think Hamas clearly wants us to be talking about the possibility that they will kill hostages as the Israelis approach. We had heard this possibility. I think Hamas had threatened this uh, after the uh, incredible rescue operation that the Israelis uh, had conducted. Remember Noah Argamani, uh, who had come back home, and you've seen her in public. She was at the uh, 
uh, Congress, when Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the Congress, there had been a statement put out uh, to anybody holding a hostage, if the Israelis are approaching, don't hesitate, kill the hostages. That was part of the psychological warfare at the time. We have to assess whether or not that is actually a standing order that's being uh, honored after what we're learning tonight. And the Israelis are going to have to take that into account as well. They want us to think about this. They want us to have this conversation. They want the Israelis to have complete internal strife and chaos over this issue. It's why they took the hostages. This was their insurance card from the beginning to try to survive the response from the Israelis. And the question now before Israel, most importantly, is will you give in to the terms in Hamas's 11th hour that will allow Hamas to rebuild into what they were on October 6th? Or will you take the lessons of October 7th forward? How do you balance that with the risk to the hostages? How do you balance that with talking to a family member of a hostage to say, I'm sorry, we cannot withdraw our forces from the Egyptian border and allow Hamas to bring weapons back in and rebuild to what they were. That is not something I would ever envy in a leader right now. It is what is weighing on Benjamin and Netanyahu and the rest of the Israeli cabinet. It's what you will see in the media in the context of an already convulsive Israeli body politic. And we're going to have to, as Americans, step back and understand that we're seeing a lot of Israeli politics in the news in addition to what Hamas is putting out in their disinformation. And, and all I would say is, in the end, it's Israel's prerogative how they're going to deal with this. It's their, it's, it, they were attacked on October 7th. They're the ones who have most uh, of their citizens held hostage. We as Americans, however, still have eight Americans, whether they are dead or alive, in Hamas's hands. All eight of them need to come home, whether they are dead or alive. And if they are alive, we should be doing everything possible from our joint special operations command uh, to anywhere else in the CIA, et cetera, supporting the Israelis to find them and get them hopefully alive. And those who are not alive, get their bodies and bring them home to their loved ones. Otherwise, the passport that you are issued as a United States citizen doesn't mean very much. All right, Rich Goldberg, thank you. And stay with us, hang tight. Um, we're probably going to be coming back to you, but we appreciate your time for now. We'll come back to you here in just a little bit. Uh, for 